session for IMM medicine and uh, it is on hematology. So basically it is introduction to hematology and we will touch a topic uh, from hematology that is important from exam point of view. So let's start with the quote of the day. It is never too late to be who you might have been. So just start your journey whenever you realize that it is important. Coming to the session agenda. Uh, today, we will cover initially the components of the blood and its functions. We will briefly see what are the disorders of RBCs and anemia classification. Then we will uh, have a detailed look on hemolytic anemias and we'll discuss a case scenario at the end related to the today's topic. So let's just start with the components of blood. What basically blood is composed of, it is plasma and cells. 55% plasma and 45% cells. If we consider plasma, then among 55%, it is 90% water and 10% is solid and gases. And in remaining 45%, which is cellular component, there are three types of cells, WBCs, RBCs, and platelets. So coming to the detailed composition, when we talk about plasma, it is 90% water as we have uh, read and the other cell, uh, other components in the plasma are ions, organic molecules like amino acids, proteins, glucose, lipids, nitrogenous wastes, and among proteins, albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. All are the organic molecules which are component of the plasma and then trace elements and vitamins and gases. Gas is most important because the main function of the blood is distributive function as we will study later. So it is carbon dioxide and oxygen which are included in the plasma component of the blood. So let's come into the cellular components. Cellular elements are three types of the cells, RBCs, white blood cells, and platelets. So RBCs are the disorders which are uh, affecting the red blood cells, usually anemias and polycythemias. When we consider white blood cells, then there are five types of cells. And basically, we divide the five these five types into two main types, that is agranulocytes and granulocytes. In granulocytes, there are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And in agranulocytes, there are lymphocytes and the monocytes. So these are all the white blood cells, which can lead to defects in which lead to leukemias, lymphomas, different kinds of immunity disorders and infectious mononucleosis and a long list. So platelets as the uh, platelets are the third component, which are cellular element of the blood and platelets are uh, basically important for coagulation, cascade and uh, the protective function of the blood. So Let's just start to discuss the functions of the blood. There are three main types of the functions of blood. One is distributive function, second is regulatory function, and third is protective function. So when we talk about the distributive function, there are different kinds of elements, different kinds of gases, hormones that blood transport from one part of the body to the other. So if we consider oxygen, it carries oxygen from lung and nutrients from GI and body stores to all the cells. If we consider waste elements, so blood carries waste from all cells to elimination sites like lungs for CO2, liver for bilirubin and kidneys for nitrogenous wastes. And if we talk about hormones, then Blood carries different kinds of hormones or chemical signals from endocrine organs to different target tissues. So all these are distributive function of the cell uh, function of the blood. And it are these are mainly carried by the plasma as well as the cellular component of the blood. Then coming to the second function, it is regulatory function. Regulatory function means blood regulates body temperature, body pH and maintain adequate fluid volume in the body. So these are the regulatory functions of the blood. And number three is protective functions. 
in protective functions basically coagulation cascade and wbcs are important in coagulation cascade platelets prevents the blood loss by initiating clotting mechanisms in response to blood vessel damage and in uh, infections wbcs protect the body against infections and the plasma immune proteins are also important in this function so these are main three type of the functions that blood is blood blood performed in our body so just let coming to the let's coming to the uh, disorders of rbcs basically disorders of rbcs we divide into anemia that is decrease in the amount of rbcs polycythemia that is too many rbcs and then hemochromatosis that is a chemical kind of a uh, blood disorder related to the rbcs so if we talk about anemia there are multiple reasons that lead to anemia so depending upon these reasons anemia is classified into different categories so anemia can be red cell enzyme deficiencies that is like g6 phosphor dehydrogenase deficiency red cell membrane disorders like hereditary spherocytosis and hemoglobinopathies like different type of defects in the hemoglobin structure like sickle cell disease and thalassemia then there is a vast category of hemolytic anemia that we will discuss in today's lecture in detail then nutritional anemias nutritional anemias are due to different deficiency of different elements that are important in the formation of hemoglobin that is iron deficiency anemia and folate deficiency anemia then there are disorders of heme production like uh, sideroblastic anemias these are all kind of anemia so let's just have a look on different types of classifications that are used in to classify anemia first of all we can classify anemia into regenerative or non regenerative types this is basically because depending upon the count of reticulocytes in the blood so if we have after looking into anemia that the patient has patient presented to you with different symptoms and you got patients cbc and in cbc you have a decrease hp level so hp level basically indicates that patient is anemic so the, the next step is you see for reticulocyte counts reticulocyte counts uh, uh divide the anemia into two types regenerative or non regenerative type if the reticulocytes count are increased it means regenerative type of anemia is there that is the capacity of blood production of the body is normal but there is different other there are different other reasons due to which the patient is anemic and if the reticulocyte count is decreased it is basically it basically determines that it is non regenerative type of anemia that is the bone marrow itself is not able to generate rbcs so depending upon reticulocyte count we divide anemia into regenerative type and non regenerative type in regenerative type then we divide into hemolysis and blood loss hemolysis can be due to multiple causes that we will discuss later and blood loss can be due to trauma bleeding lesions parasites are hemostatic disorders then coming to the non regenerative type non regenerative type can be because of primary bone marrow disorders like aplastic anemia myelodysplastic syndromes myelopathy myelopathies and myelofibrosis and pure red cell aplasia and it can be due to secondary anemia because of deficiency of different uh, intrinsic factors for regeneration of rbcs so let's come to the classification of anemia depending upon morphology and hemoglobin concentration basically when we see the cbc of a patient with low hp we will consider two factors in the cbc that is mean corpuscular volume and mch is mean corpuscular hemoglobin so this these two determine whether the patient has hypochromic microcytic hyperchromic macrocytic or normochromic normocytic anemia if the mcv is disturbed 
that is mcv is decreased it means microcytic or macrocytic anemia is there and if it is the mch then it means hp concentration basically is impaired and it is hypochromic or hyperchromic or normochromic so then there is an other classification type depending upon etiology that is impaired erythropoiesis the same like if we have decreased reticulocyte counts it, it means there is impaired erythropoiesis then rbc depletion or hemolysis we will discuss that how we detect hemolysis in the blood then there may be loss of rbcs or impaired rbc distribution so all these are different kind of classifications we use in anemia and all these kind of anemia classification are important regarding exam point of view so let's just come to the hemolytic anemia what is hemolytic anemia hemolysis is the premature destruction of erythrocytes a hemolytic anemia will develop if bone marrow activity cannot compensate for erythrocyte loss so basically there is loss of rbcs from body due to any reason and the bone marrow is not able to compensate that loss so the severity of anemia depends upon whether the onset of hemolysis is gradual so that the it will be less severe if the gradual uh, if the onset is gradual because the bone marrow will compensate for the uh, blood loss but if it is abrupt then bone marrow will not be able to compensate for the hemolysis and there will be more severe hemolytic anemia and then on the on extent of erythrocyte destruction that how rapidly the destruction of rbc is there so hemolysis can be intravascular extravascular or both so these are all types of hemolysis let's come to the hemolytic anemia classification we divide hemolytic anemia into two main types the one is red cell abnormality and the other is extra corpuscular factors so if we consider red cell abnormality it can be hereditary or it can be acquired hereditary abnormalities include hemoglobin abnormalities like hemoglobinopathy thalassemia sickle cell anemia there can be membrane defect like spherocytosis erythrocytosis there can be enzyme defect like gd g6 g6 pd deficiency and pyruvate kinase deficiency and it can be acquired red cell abnormality that is membrane abnormality paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea is an example coming to the extra corpuscular factors extra corpuscular factors are basically the factors that destroy the rbcs there is no defect in the rbc morphology or rbc shape or hemoglobin structure but there are factors that destroy the rbcs in the vessels so immune hemolytic anemias are non immune hemolytic anemias immune hemolytic anemias then again we divide into autoimmune and transfusion of incompatible blood then then if we consider the non immune hemolytic anemias it can be because of chemicals bacterial infections parasitic infections hemolysis due to physical trauma like hemolytic uremic syndrome thrombotic thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura prostatic heart valves or hyperspirism so all these are types of extra extra corpuscular factors that lead to hemolysis in the body and this is basically the diagrammatic a uh, representation of different kind of hemoglobinopathies or membrane cell defects in which there are different shape of rbcs that we detect on peripheral smear of peripheral smear of the blood of patient so hemolytic anemias if we summarize again can be inherited or acquired inherited may be due to membrane defects or internal like hemoglobin or enzyme deficiencies and acquired can be due to environmental factors membrane or internally like infections or toxins so let's just come to the point that how we detect hemolysis that a patient is having anemia and then there is a factor of hemolysis uh in the patient we 
detect hemolysis by performing different investigations. The investigations important are lactate dehydrogenase levels like LDH levels. In hemolysis, LDH levels are always elevated. So patient will present with decreased HP levels, increased reticulocyte counts, MCV and MCH will be usually normal in hemolytic anemias, but it can be disturbed. And then there will be LDH elevated levels. And LDH elevated level, why it is there? It is because the lysed RBCs, broken RBCs release LDH into the blood. So the other thing we can detect is unconjugated bilirubin. Unconjugated bilirubin is also increased in hemolysis, that is, Always the bilirubin levels are increased and in bili total bilirubin level, the unconjugated bilirubin is the bilirubin type that is increased due to hemolysis. So in basic baseline labs, we have increased LDH and increased unconjugated bilirubin levels that indicate that the patient has hemolysis. Then peripheral blood smear, we always perform patients peripheral blood smear if we have a patient with decreased HP levels and we detect that there is any kind of anemia, chronic anemia in a patient. So we perform peripheral blood smear that, uh, that helps to detect the type of anemia and the cause of anemia in a patient. So peripheral blood smear in hemolytic anemia will show the abnormal red blood cells. Abnormal red blood cells can be of any type, like it can be spherocytes, it can be elliptocytes, it can be sickle cells, it can be hemes, bodies, or fragments of the RBCs. So depending upon the cause, there can be there are abnormal red blood cells in the peripheral blood smear of a patient. So, so at the end, you can in urine analysis, we can have urobilinogen and the positive for blood. That is, urine analysis is showing free hemoglobin or it or its metabolites in the urine. So all these investigations we perform to detect, to confirm the diagnosis of hemolysis and then to identify the cause of underlying cause of the hemolysis. Coming to the, this is the diagram that represents the algorithm for diagnosis of hemolytic anemia, the cause of hemolytic anemia, how we identify what is the cause of hemolytic anemia. So, first of all, we perform RBC count in the CBC, then reticulocytes, and then we perform different investigations. So, we divide the anemia into two types that either it is due to increased red cell production or it is due to increased red cell breakdown. So if there is increased red cell production, there will be increased reticulocytosis or polygomasia, erythroid hyperplasia of the bone marrow. And if there is increased red cell breakdown, it will cause anemia and serum bilirubin increase, LDH increase, urobilogen increase and decrease plasma hypoglobin with positive urinary hemocytin. So this is basically the same thing we have discussed in this previous chart that there are different tests that indicate the cause of hemolysis and the type of hemolytic anemia in patients. So after this, this, these all investigations will confirm the diagnosis of hemolysis. Then the blood film will be performed, peripheral blood smear will be performed. And if it indicates abnormal red cells, we will perform hemoglobin electrophoresis that will lead to the diagnosis of thalassemia, sickle cell disease, or hemoglobin C, D, E, or H type of defects. So basically hemoglobin electrophoresis we perform for identification of hemoglobinopathies. And if the blood film shows spherocytes, we perform further direct home test of the patient. Direct home test, if it is positive, then it means that it is autoimmune hemolytic anemia, either IgG warm, that is warm antibody, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, or cold antibody, autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And if we perform 
or there can be another cause of direct immune test positive that is different drugs methyl dopa quinine and cers are interferons that we will identify from the history of the patient so spherocytes if there are positive and direct immune test is negative it can be due to hereditary spherocytosis malaria or clostridium infections this is the second type that spherocytes are positive on peripheral blood film if on peripheral blood film there are other type of abnormal cells like white cells we have blister cells or hinge bodies we consider the different enzyme deficiencies in the patient and if there are fragments of the cells in the peripheral blood film we consider microangiopathic hemolytic anemia like eclampsia hus ttp or dic all these are a uh, different kind of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia so this is the algorithm that is very important from exam point of view you can detect any kind of hemolytic anemia by the different investigations given in the scenario and you can reach the diagnosis and for the management so there is this is the brief uh, about autoimmune hemolytic anemia treatment if there is if it is warm type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia you consider steroid as a first line of drug and you continue steroids until the hb is more than 10 and the there is no evidence of further hemolysis and mean duration is almost 8.5 months and if there is cold antibody hemolytic anemia then you perform plasmapheresis or iv immunoglobulin therapy and then further there are options like rituximab we can use uh, bortezomib or different other uh, drugs for treatment of autoimmune hemolytic anemia so this is all about autoimmune hemolytic anemia and uh, uh, now we will uh, discuss a patient who is 81 years old and her daughter brought her to the emergency department because of weakness cough and chest pain she is diagnosed basically with anemia and on peripheral smear there is macrocytosis so we have two findings till now that the patient is anemic and there are macrocytes on the blood peripheral blood film chest x ray and ecg are normal and she stated that everyone in her family had a hemolytic anemia so this point basically indicates that there may be a hereditary type of defect so for macro when we have macrocytes on the blood we consider either there may be pernicious anemia vitamin b12 deficiency a like different deficiency type of anemia or there may be hereditary hemolytic anemia so this point actually differentiates that there may be a hereditary hemolytic anemia so she had in further uh, probing the history she had several episodes herself over the years sometimes triggered by an infection and although she had not she does not remember the details the emergency department physician was not comfortable sending her home and suspected that there may be another an underlying problem and she was subsequently admitted for observation to the hospital services and for the investigation so differential still now we have vitamin b12 deficiency pernicious anemia and then hereditary type of hemolytic anemia so further investigations performed and it shows normal b vitamin b12 level and folate level so we have differentiated we have ruled out that there is no b12 deficiency or folate levels deficiency so the other uh, diagnosis that is indicated through this scenario is hereditary type of hemolytic anemia so we performed peripheral blood smear of the patient and it shows stromatocytes and there are no spherocytes or schistocytes so we make the diagnosis of hereditary stromatocytosis of the patient so this is all about today's lecture i hope the lecture will be fruitful for uh, the candidates preparing for imm examination if there are any question by the candidates by the participants you are welcome to ask
so just <clears throat> let's uh, wrap up and uh, meet next time with another informative lecture for AMM medicine. Recording stopped.